Hi there, my name is Will, and welcome to another Deep Dive of Workflow Components. Today, we're gonna to be walking through outputs and how you can use these to dynamically pass data between your tasks and make your workflows even more powerful. Now, an output is simply something that is generated from a task that you can then use later on. Now, this can be a value or a file, and these are generally stored in the execution context, so you can use them downstream in later tasks. Outputs can have multiple attributes, so it's best checking the documentation for the type of plugin that you're trying to use to make sure you know what sort of outputs it will generate. In this example, I have a return type task that is going to return the format, my output with the execution ID. We can then access this later on in our log task. To be able to access these outputs, we can use an expression as produced here. And this expression goes in the format of having outputs dot the ID of the task dot the name of the output. Now, if you don't know the name of the output, don't worry because we can head over to the documentation and if I go to that return task, I can see that it produces the output value. So I know I can do dot value there to access it. Let's check this out when we press execute. And as we can see, it has returned the value and we can see that it was able to then get that same value in the log. We can also head over to the outputs tab here where we can view these between the different tasks. So here we can see that our return task was able to get that value and then we can see that it was successfully used in the log later on. In this next example, I'm able to use a file input and then this shell commands task is then going to create a new file and save it to the internal storage. And then because this is saved to the internal storage, we can then access it as an output, both for later tasks, but also in the execution state as well. Here, when I press execute, we'll see that it's going to successfully rename the file. And then when we head to outputs, we'll be able to see that the file is available and we can then view it. So file.tmp was the one that we then put in, but I can also preview inside of Kestra the other file as well. You can also download it too if you'd prefer to do that as well. In this next example, we're going to loop through a number of values and we're then able to use dynamic variables to be able to access outputs as they're generated. When we execute this, we can see that it does execute three times because we can see in this example, there are in fact three values inside of this array. And then what it does is it accesses the value based on the task run that is currently happening. And we can then see that value in there. So now if we go back to the execution there and go over to the logs, we'll be able to see that this was in fact successful with the different values. If we go back over to the execution and then head over to outputs, we'll be able to see that it was in fact generating the output with value one, value two, and value three on each task run. In this next example, we're able to then loop over some JSON values. So as you can see here, we have two JSONs ready to go and we're then able to loop over them using the expression here, JSON, to be able to get that as a JSON value. And then we can then use dot key to be able to get certain key value pairs out of that JSON. When we execute this, we'll be able to see that it does successfully loop over them. And again, we can see that the values were successful in the outputs tab. Here we can access specific outputs for dynamic tasks. In this each sequential loop, we're going to generate three outputs because we have an array here that is got three items inside of it. Now, because of that, we, if we wanna be able to access just one of those specifically, we can do that later on here by referencing the value that was used at that time. So in that case, S1. So when sub is run for S1, we can then get the value for the return using this format. So it makes it really helpful if you know that you wanna get a specific thing out of a dynamic task. So in this example, what we should see here, the task ID, the task run value, and the task run start date for S1. So let's execute this and see this in action. And as we can see here, we can see that use was in fact able to get S1 as of the task run value, which is good to see. And then that's the date it had. But we can also see the other examples that was produced as well in using those different I values inside of the array. In this next example, we're gonna loop through a number of values like we did in the last one. And again, then access a specific value at the end, but we don't have to use the dot notation like we did before. Instead, we can use a key inside of a square bracket, similar to how you would with a JSON typically. So here we wanna get a value one specifically, and then we can then access that value in that sort of format. So when I execute this, we're gonna be able to see that the outputs generated is the value for each during each run. 
And then when we get to end, we can see end is greater than value one as we would expect. In this next example, we're gonna be able to look up in sibling tasks. So if we use each sequential, we can access data in a second task within the loop, but to do so, we have to use this format where we have the square bracket and then we do task run dot value inside of it to be able to get the value from the task above. If the task tree is static, such as using the just the sequential task, then you can do the dot notation that we showed earlier. This is important because there can be multiple levels and this helps clarify exactly what we're trying to reference. As you can see, we do actually access a huge number of outputs and we can see that those values were correctly uh, retrieved in the second task when it executed. Now, since Kestra 0.15, you've been able to now specify a specific output property at the bottom of your flow. This means if you know a task is gonna produce an output, you can specify exactly an ID for it, the type, and then maybe a custom expression if you know that you need to be able to do some extra stuff to it beyond just using the standard expression like we have here. This is especially useful if you're using a subflow and you don't necessarily know what that subflow is going to produce because it's separate. So you can define it in an output block like so, and then you can reference it in your parent flow where it's getting cooled. This makes it just a little bit easier for being able to pass outputs between your subflow and your parent flow. We can see that when I execute this and the output is produced, and we can see again, the output is produced. We can also go to overview and see that the output is produced there at the bottom as well. And here is an example that actually calls that flow that we just had as a subflow. And then we can access that output dot final, which is what we defined in this separate block. So here, when I execute this, we'll be able to see that it does create the execution and it does successfully get the output that we we're expecting called final. And we can see that in the outputs tab like so. The outputs page is also really useful for being able to preview files as well. In this example, I'm gonna download an ion file from Hugging Face, but I wanna be able to view that rather than just see that I've downloaded a file. So here, when I go over to the URI, I can see that, you're, that I have in fact downloaded a file, it gives me the option to download or preview it, but here I can see it in a really nice table format and I can expand that out as well if I wanna be able to view it a little bit easier. And then last but not least, we also can use debug outputs to be able to help us debug the outputs generated. So here, if I just execute this to us, it's gonna generate a JSON. I can see in the outputs tab that I have this option here to debug outputs. Now, if I just click on the debug outputs, it's gonna produce me an expression, something that we're already familiar with. And so here I can now just put any expression I like in and test what's working. So here I can actually just put in outputs and here it's going to produce me every output produced by every task i can then specifically just refer to the task in hand which would be sample json and here we can see that it's going to give me less data here i can then filter even further to dot value and so on and i can even actually use the json wrapper that we used earlier to be able to get this a little bit cleaner so i can then do something like this and it's going to give us just the array inside of the json so Really helpful if you're trying to debug maybe a large data set that you've got from the internet, or maybe you've just got a task that produces complex uh, outputs and you're just not quite sure how you're supposed to access them. Well, you can debug it using this method here. Hopefully you found that useful and you're gonna start using outputs to create really powerful flows in Kestra. Let us know in the comments below how you use outputs on a daily basis and what your favorite parts are. And don't forget to join our Slack community where you can discuss with us further and ask questions.